My name is Sebastian, and for the last 16 years or so, I've been doing things with PHP and to PHP. And uh, around 14 years ago, I started to work on a little tool called PHP Unit. And what drives me as a person, both in my private life and um, professionally, is that I have a passion for helping developers build better software. Most um, commonly build better software with PHP, and that's what I like to do. And six years ago, I founded a company with, together with two good friends and also well-known people from the PHP community, uh, the PHP consulting company, where we help PHP developers uh, with our, by sharing our experience with them, and that's about as much advertising that I'm going to do. So what is this talk about? To be honest, I'm not exactly sure, because it's so many interesting things in there that I wanted to throw into one talk and mix it and stir it around and let's see what happens. So this is about web applications. And if you look at web applications, you have at least four different aspects that you deal with or that you have to deal with when you build a web application. You have to deal with obviously the domain logic which is all about your business. You have to deal with things such as infrastructure code like persistence. You need to store data and get data back. Um, you need to deal with application logic. A request comes in, you need to abstract HTTP. A request comes in, you need to figure out which code to run, which code to dispatch to. You need to think about routing and whether or not um, model view controller actually makes sense on the web. That's completely outside of the scope of this talk. Um, you need to think about controllers, processors, handlers, responders, whatever you want to call them. And in the end, um, we need to present something to the user. So we have to think about presentation model, views, and templates. But the most important bit, and no framework can help you with that because it involves thinking um, and listening to your customer and th figuring out a good way to represent the customer's business domain in code is the domain logic. And this is really the heart and soul uh, of every um, application that you build. So if you look at uh, Eric Evans's um, seminal book on domain-driven design. This is his definition for what domain logic is about. It's responsible for representing concepts of the business, information about the business situation and business rules. State that reflects the business situation is controlled and used here, even though the technical details of storing it are delegated to the infrastructure. It is the heart and soul of business software. And Unfortunately, I, on a regular basis, come into a team and want to help them build better software, build higher quality software, get them started on testing the application, for instance. And what I find is that their business logic, their domain logic, is not represented in a canonical way somewhere in the application. Their code is not, or their development is not driven by the domain. Their development is driven by other aspects. Most often, it's either screen design driven or persistence driven or database driven. So, on the one hand, you look at the screen designs that come out of uh, the design department and each screen is given to a different de developer, and the developer goes and implements just this one single page, which leads to a lot of code duplication, and it also leads to the fact that 
domain logic and business processes are not implemented just once in one central place in the application, but in many different ways. And it's not obvious where I have to touch the code to change a certain business requirement. And on the other hand, you have um, development processes that are too much focused on the database. You have the existing database schema and you're not allowed to change it. And you think about the database first with, before you start to think about um, business logic, business rules, and domain logic. And both lead to situations where you get unmaintainable, untestable code. So we want to avoid that. Because when you cannot test your domain logic, the heart of your software, as we have just learned, uh, using unit tests in isolation from persistence and the web context, then unfortunately you, you are in for a lot of pain. And believe me, I've seen it a lot over the years. And while there is a thing called pain-driven development, and that's sometimes really useful, so for instance, um, just to tell you a little bit about my personal history, I would have never, <coughs> excuse me, started, uh, I would never have started to work on tools such as PHP Unit if I didn't had the pain back then, 14, 15 years ago, of not having these tools. But in a more general way, you don't want pain. You, don't, you want to avoid the pain. So at some point, you need to think about clean code. You want to write clean code and domain-driven design, from my experience, leads uh, to clean code. It's code that can be read and enhanced by a developer other than its original author. Yes, that is true. And that is very important because although many developers don't like this fact, but software development is more about human-human interaction than about human-machine interaction. It's very easy to write code that the machine can understand and run. It's a lot harder to write code that your colleague can read and understand and maintain. And trust me, it's also sometimes hard to write code that you yourself can understand a year from now. So, clean code can be read and enhanced by a developer other than its original author. It has unit and acceptance tests. Only having one of the two and you get into the pain area again. So the unit tests tell you that you built your application right. They don't tell you anything about that you're building the right application. That's what the acceptance tests are for. It has meaningful names. It provides one way rather than many ways for doing one thing. It has minimal dependencies which are explicitly defined and provides a clear minimal API. So how do Um, over a year ago, when I started to think about um, the things that I'm going to talk about right now, I realized that there is one design pattern that is underappreciated, that doesn't get as much attention as other design patterns, and that's um, state, which allows an object to alter its behavior when its internal state changes the object will appear to change its class. And that's sometimes really, really useful to implement um, business rules, for instance. So let's start with a really simple example. Let's consider a real world object from our everyday life, which is a door. A door can be open, it can be closed, it can be locked. An open door can be closed, it cannot be opened because it is already open. It cannot be locked. Well, it could be locked, but then we, couldn't, we wouldn't be able to close it again. It would blow up the example. But let's just, to keep it simple, say that an open door cannot be locked because it doesn't make sense. And it can, cannot be unlocked because it's already unlocked because it's open. A closed door cannot be closed because it's already closed. It can be opened. It can be locked. It cannot be unlocked. A locked door cannot be closed. It cannot be opened because it's locked. It cannot be locked because it's already locked. And it can be unlocked. So really simple example. We have three states and some characteristics about each state and some information already somewhere in there 
about how we can get from one state to another. If we have an open door and we close it, we come to the closed, uh, closed door. So how would we implement something like this in PHP code? What would this look like? Or what could this look like? We start, really simple, with an interface that captures the information about the state of the door. And it provides us with the four operations that are, in theory, possible on any given state. We can open the door, we can close the door, we can lock the door, or we can unlock the door. Then we build an abstract class that implements this interface and by default implement all of these four methods in a way that they throw an exception, that this operation is not allowed in the current state. This allows us to make the individual implementations of the actual concrete state classes really simple and readable. So for instance, when we are in the open door state, when the door is open, the only operation that should be allowed is the closed operation. And it returns a closed door state. And of course, if this were a real world um, application and not implementing um, a simple example just as this one, there would be more code, of course, in this closed method than just moving on to the next state. But to keep it simple and to make the example fit on the screen, um, I trust you that you can imagine that there's more code there. So closed door state, we have two operations that are allowed, open and lock. We can move to the open door state and the locked door state. And finally, from the locked door state, if we invoke the unlock, or if we send the unlock message, we move on to the closed door state. So now we just need a facade, the door, the actual door object that knows how to deal with these states that the door can be in, and that abstracts away from the, uh, the client code all these internal transitions. So our door gets in the constructor a door state, and it has open, close, lock, and unlock methods that delegate to the current state. And if an operation is not allowed in the current state, we get an exception. And it's also now really easy to figure out which state we are currently in. We can implement methods such as is open, is closed, and is locked. And all we have to do is look at the state object that we have aggregated in the door object and figure out is it the open door state object, then we are open. And this is an example of what client code might look like that uses these objects. We start with an open door, we instantiate a new object of the door class and pass in the open door state to signal the door is currently open. We can ask a door whether it is open by calling the isOpen method and it returns true. We can close the door and see that it has worked by asking the object again, are you closed now? Yes, the door is closed, we get it through. We can lock the door and it's locked and when we try to lock the door again, we get an illegal state transition object, uh, exception because it's already locked. Locked is not allowed operation when we are in the locked state. So code like this is really readable and maintainable. If I know, that if I want to change something about the door, I know exactly where to look. I only need to look at the door and its door state classes. I don't need to look all over the code base wherever I'm doing something with the door. It's code that uh, adheres a single responsibility principle. The door is responsible for the, do um, well, the door class is responsible for the door and nothing else. It's not tangled and, um, with other code, it's not scattered around the code base. It's not implemented multiple times, and that's really easy. Now, yes, our domain concepts and our business rules for how 
the door operates is reflected clearly and canonically in the code. That's good. Would also be nice to extract this information from the code and visualize it somehow. There is a subfield of software engineering called software visualization. And there's lots of interesting stuff happening there. Lots of interesting research and lots of good tools um, that are being developed and that you can run on your code base to visualize various different aspects um, about your code. For instance, um, there's a tool called JURS that looks at the history of your project in version control and visualizes how the project grew over time, which developer touched which part of the system and so on. It's really interesting to see how often the code changes and who is working on which parts of the system and so on. Lots of in useful information you can get from that. There's tools um, like PHP Depend that look at your code base and visualize which part of the code base depend on, uh, on which other parts of the code base. So in general, software visualization gives us information from either running the code or statically analyzing the code and presents it in a, in a usable, uh, usable way. So this is a, I don't remember, five or ten minute hack by that I did um, a while ago um, on a train while I was bored. And I apologize for this really hard to read code right here. I copy and pasted that from PHP unit. Uh, there's lots of code inside PHP unit that I'm not proud of. And that's one of it because it's totally un uh, not really readable, doesn't really speak to me, but it does what it is supposed to do. It does something with annotations. So talking about visualization, there is this really great tool called GraphVis, which um, somebody or a team at AT&T started working on decades ago to visualize their telephone network. And a couple of years ago, they open sourced it. And it's now the standard for visualizing um, network graphs or directed graphs. And it's really easy. You have, um, just need to provide a markup and it figures out how to beautifully um, visualize the graph. And uh, there is a really interesting definition for, or a mathematical defi definition of what a beautiful visualization of a graph is, which comes down to that you minimize um, the overlap of edges. So all we have to do is look at our code, iterate over all the classes, look for the open, close, lock, and unlock methods, see for each state class what new state open, close, lock, and unlock return, generate markup for graphics out of this, and run the tool. And then we get, then we get a graph like this. So we had the door with its three states. We had the allowed operations to get from one state to the other. We wrote this down in clean code. We wrote um, ugly script to iterate over the code, to statically analyze it, and to give us this graph. And now we can see, OK, we have three states. These are the transitions between the states. And this is something that we can use to document the code. This is something that we can use to discuss with a non-technical person. Then, although the code is clean and the code is easy and maintainable and testable and easy to understand for developers, it's still hard to understand what's going down in the code for a non-technical person, and a visualization like this can help. So we started with the door, we implemented code, and now we got the visualization and the graph. And this graph, by the way, is a so-called state machine, which is a model of computation used to design computer programs. It's conceived as an abstract machine that, one, that can be in one of a finite number of states. The states are the open door, the closed door, and the locked door. 
the machine can only be in one state at a, uh, at a time and it's specified explicitly how you can get from one stage to, the, to another. So why didn't we start with the state machine in the beginning? Wouldn't it have been more interesting to not talk about code and um, just start with the state machine and see if we can automatically generate the code? So roll back, back to the door. This is our door example. We already know that, so we can skip it. This is our state machine. This is just another representation of the data that we have here, of the information that we have here. And the code that we had before is also just another representation of this information. So how do we get from the state machine to code? So I am not a big fan of code generation, but well, I was burned, if you will, a couple of years ago by code generation. Um, I was, a well, brief side story, I was asked um, by a German magazine to write an article about uh, Symphony back when the first version came out a really long time ago, and it was really, really focused on code generation back then. And the magazine gave me uh, and Stefan, who, who co-authored the article, um, a very specific task. And they also gave the task to a Rails developer, um, to a Perl developer, to a Python developer, to a Java developer, and to a .NET developer. And their idea for the article was figure out how long it takes each of the different programming language teams to implement the application and how much code comes out of it. Turned out in, um, that Stefan and I did not write a single line of PHP code for this application. We wrote 20 lines of YAML configuration for Symfony back then. And then Symfony's code generator turned, this, turned these 20 lines of code into almost 10,000 lines of generated PHP code. And ever since then, I was scared of generated code. I trust the Symfony developers that they know what these 10,000 lines of code do and I trust them that they have tested the code generator that turns the 20 lines of YAML into 10,000 lines of PHP. But when I run this and look at the generated code, it's code that I have in my project that I am responsible for and that I don't, that I don't have any tests for. So, so that scared me. But at least Stefan and I won the competition with the other uh, teams because the Java team took four weeks and produced a lot less code, but they also didn't implement all the features. Uh, the Python team and the .NET team never delivered. Um, and I don't know what happened to the Perl team, but um, yeah, and, and Rails was very similar to what we, what we had with Symfony. So coming back to this presentation. So when I started to think about uh, the state machine and the state pattern and so on, I thought, okay, maybe starting from the state machine, it makes sense to generate code for that, but only if we can also think about uh, the testing at some point. So code generation. Um, This is also just another representation about what we have about our door. It's an XML file. People sometimes are bewildered by the fact that people like me like XML. There are so much more modern and hyped representations like JSON or YAML, but I really like XML because you can have a schema for it and you can automatically validate it and it just works. No need to reinvent the wheel all the time. So in this XML document, we capture the information about the domain logic, about our door. We have the three states, the open door state, the closed door state, and the locked door state, and we specify or configure what we want the query methods to be named. So for the open door state, we want the method to be called is open, for closed is closed, and for locked is locked, and so on. 
really find the allowed transitions so we can go from closed door to open door by using the open operation and so on. And finally, we also provide a little bit more information about the four possible operations, which is open, close, lock, and unlock, so that we can automatically generate methods with meaningful names like can be opened and cannot be opened. And implementing the code generator turned out to be quite simple. Uh, and the code is much cleaner than the visualization thingy that I showed earlier. So we need a parser to parse the XML file, that's the most boring part. We need to generate code for the door interface class. We need to generate code for the abstract state class. We need code to generate um, the door class. And then we need code to generate the individual state classes. And that's what it says right there. And then we invoke them, and it just works. Give you, hello? Ah, oh, wrong button. Um, so this is just to give you a quick exa um, idea of what this might look like. This is what the interface generator looks like. It gets an array with the operations and the name of the interface. Um, and then it just iterates over the operations, uses some templates to generate the code, and then it writes the generated code to a file. Very similar um, for, for, for the other classes, like the abstract state class, the state class generator, class generator, and so on. Not that much to see there, basically all the interesting stuff, if you will, is in, in the templates. And this is just, what the, just one example of what the template for, um, oh, that's what that was the wrong one, what um, the class looks like. So nothing really fancy. But of course, like I mentioned earlier, I'm scared about code without tests especially when it comes to generated code, because using generated code that has no unit tests is like crossing a river over a single rope bridge while you're drunk with a gorilla roll, uh, holding the rope. <laughs> and of course, you have to have pirates, right? So that's how much this scares me. So. Thankfully, it's also with all the information that we have in the XML file about our state machine, it's also really simple to generate the tests automatically. So for instance, if I run, let's put the cursor out of the way, if I run the generated tests for the generated code using PHP unit, and PHP unit's test docs functionality, uh, I get an execute, the output of an executable specification for my generated code. So the closed door is not open, it is closed, it is not locked, it can be opened, it cannot be closed, it can be locked, it cannot be unlocked, and so on. And that's, again, just another um, way of presenting the information that I have in the code. In essence, this is the information that I had at the very beginning um, that I used to generate my state machine and then used to generate, generate the code. Then I run the generated tests for the generated code and I get back to this to verify, yes, I came full circle. This is actually what I wanted to have. And just to give you an example, this is what the generated co test code looks like for the closed door test. We create a door object that is in the closed door state. We test that it is not open, that it is closed, that it cannot be locked, uh, that, it, that it is not locked, that it can be opened, that it cannot be closed, that it can be locked, and that it cannot be unlocked. Really simple, nothing scary. So enough about doors. What about the real world? 
what was what was it or what was the example what was the problem that triggered me to think about this so a lot of the teams that i work with they make money on the internet apparently apparently that's a thing so in a typical e-commerce application you have a defined process for how you accept payments. And this is a very simplified version uh, of the workflow that we were working on um, when I started thinking about code generation. So we ha an order comes in, and initially the order is pending. Um, usually it's put into a queue, and then we check, OK, um, yes, we still have this in stock. We decrement the stock, assign this item to this order, and basically that's what accepting the order means. Then we process the payment. Now that we know, okay, we actually can fulfill the order, do we have the money? Did we get the money? Then the order can be paid, and then we can start with shipping. At some point, the order will be shipped, and then after a while, it's closed. It goes into the archive. On the other hand, for various reasons, we could reject the order. And it's, again, simplified so that it fits on the screen. Um, could also happen that the payment doesn't work and that we reject it for that reason, or that we don't have the item not in stock anymore, or are not allowed to ship it to whatever. Um, you never know. We reject it, and then it immediately goes from pending to rejected to closed. And this is something that the business understands. This is their way of thinking. And we can turn this into code using a not so scary approach, like um, having our specification. We have the, the states pending, accepted, paid, shipped, rejected, closed. We can accept, re reject, pay, ship, and close. And you can use this to generate. Um, the code and the tests, and it works. Let's see if I actually have it here. My fingers are not doing what I tell them to do. Sometimes happens. So it works. And what about documentation? Also works. Good. Not so scary. So to sum up, Clean code, good. Domain-driven design, good. State pattern, good. Code generation, not scary if you also generated tests. And this is, from my experience, a really at least interesting thought experiment to think about um, how to represent uh, business processes and code, and at least very useful to prototype um, business process code. Any questions? The code, by the way, uh, is on GitHub. Feel free to play around with it. Uh, any questions? Too early in the morning for questions. You didn't have your coffee yet. Yes. Hey, thanks. Um, my question was, um, do generated tests um, really help uh, when, if you generate them, usually there will pass anyway? So the question was, uh, do generated tests really help? Um, to be honest, I don't know yet. Um, I, I never really used the code generation and the test generation in, in a real project. 
I just wanted to figure out if it would be possible. And I have now the proof of concept, yes, it is possible for, for at least for these state machines, for these state pattern based state machine implementations. It's possible from, uh, to generate code and test code from a specification. I, my guess is that just as you have to extend the, generate, gener uh, the generated production code to do something useful because by default it just moves from one state to the next and you would have to do real business logic inside those methods. So for instance, when you, when you ship something, you need to make sure, I don't know, that whatever, whatever happens that needs to happen when you ship something. Same for the payment and so on. My guess is that you would also have to do that with the test. But um, as I said, it's basically a thought experiment. The, the, what, what I can tell you is that using the state patterns to implement state machines to represent businesses, business processes like the payment process that I showed in code works and really helps to keep the code clean. You focus from the very beginning on the domain logic, on the business process and its rules, and represent them as cleanly as possible in code. And then it's really easy to adapt the code when the process changes for some reason. It's not scattered around the entire code base and tangled with other code. It's in one canonical place, and there's only one reason to change the classes that deal with the business process, and that's when the business process changes. And that's very valuable. All the other stuff is just fluff. Nice fluff if you're interested in code generation and software visualization and so on, but um, if it's useful, I don't know. At least not yet. Any other question? Hello. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to know if uh, you had some plan to deal with, uh, I mean, to to work with um, the PHP spec guys hmm? and um, uh, the prophecy people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people working with uh, the BDD style development things, with regards to what you've just introduced. So the question was, do I plan to talk uh, to PHP spec, BHAT, BDD people um, about this specifically? About this specifically, no. In general, I'm looking forward to talk to them. Actually, looking forward uh, to, to meet some of them for the first time at this conference. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.